All right, we will go ahead and get started. Hello, and welcome to DM2, Disease, um, Disease Development Symptoms and Management. This session is part of the DM2 track. It is intended for individuals living with DM2 and their families. The session is being recorded and it will be available for viewing after the conference on the MDF Digital Academy at www.myotonic.org slash digital hyphen academy. I'm Dr. Nadine Ann Skinner, the MDF Research Coordinator, and I am delighted to introduce our presenters today. To ask our presenters questions or to make a comment, please use the chat function. First, let me introduce Dr. Johanna Hommel. Dr. Hommel is a neurologist and a neuromuscular specialist at the University of Rochester, caring for patients with myotonic dystrophy type 1 and type 2 in clinic. As a researcher, she's interested to in learning why myotonic dystrophy type one is so variable. For example, why some people develop symptoms when they're young, others when they are much older, and why some people have mild problems while others are strongly affected. She's also interested in learning more ways about the underlying disease mechanisms in DM2 and identifying the best ways to measure symptoms and disease Dr. Hamill is leading several studies at the University of Rochester, New York to address these questions. Next, I'm gonna introduce Dr. Arya Puwanen. Uh, Dr. Puwanen is a board certified in the specialties of neurology and neuromuscular medicine. She treats both common and rare neuromuscular conditions with special emphases on myotonic dystrophy, muscle disease related to genetic conditions and myo Myoacin gravis. Her research interests have focused on developing biomarkers and clinical endpoints in myotonic dystrophy and towards acquiring and towards acquiring um, sorry about that uh, new approaches for treatments. She's also involved in therapeutic trials for broader range of neuromuscular diseases. And finally, we have Lindsay Baker. Ms. Baker asks acts as a clinical evaluator for research within the neuromuscular department of the University of Rochester Medical Center and assists with physical therapy consults within the neuromuscular clinic. She also supports physicians and physical therapists. She also supports physicians and physical therapists as they lead research projects. Thank you and welcome Johanna. Hi, good morning, everyone. Let me, I think you have to stop sharing your slides first. And then I can share. Perfect. Let me share my slides. Okay, that should work now. Okay, perfect. Um, you can all see my main slide. I would think. Yeah, perfect. Um, good morning. So today, um, we uh, thank you all for joining. First of all, we're excited about um, the session. And um, specifically, since it will be the three of us presenting, um, Lindsay and Aria uh, will be joining. And I think that's great, because you should meet as many people as possible invested in DM clinical care and research. And so the way this will look like is that I will start with an introduction on symptoms and genetics. Some of you may be very familiar with it. So for others that will be new. Uh, and then Lindsay will take it away to discuss physical therapy and management of living with muscle disease. And then Aria will finish off with the effects of DM2 on the brain. So let's get started. The first question, how many people live with DM2? And the answer to the question depends on where you live on the planet. In the US, and that's a little bit frustrating, um, but we do actually not know how many people live with DM2 in the US. Um, generally speaking, in clinic, we see patients three to five fold less common compared to DM1. Now, what does that mean? Typically, DM1 is thought to be one in 8,000 people have DM1. Now, recent studies showed that it's actually more common that people carry the mutation, like more than one in 2,100. And generally, DM2 is a little bit less frequent 
just to give you other numbers, um, you know, uh, as an estimate, we have the National Registry here at the UFR, and you might be a member of that. And we have, for example, 1,300 members of the registry with DM1 since it was um, founded in 2001, and only 250 people with DM2. Um, so, so that's kind of the, the ratio, and that holds true for the MDF registry as well. So DM2 is less common, it seems like. Um, and, but what is interesting is that DMT2 appears more common in, in people of European ancestry and in Northern European countries, actually, um, DM1 and DM2 are similarly uh, frequent. So for example, in Germany and Finland, it's one in 2,200 people has DM2 or carries the mutation for DM2. Um, and, but in generally in clinical practice here in the US, we suspect that DM2 is missed and misdiagnosed. Uh, what makes us believe that? Well, oftentimes it occurs later in life, symptoms can occur later in life, and then people oftentimes, or physicians, attribute it to all older age or not exercising enough or something like that, or, or fibromyalgia or, or other things. But um, uh, it can be often missed and misdiagnosed. And just to put data to that, personal impression. Uh, in Serbia, for example, they studied 150 people that came in for cataracts at younger age, which typically is thought of less than 55 years of age. And 7% of these people coming in with cataracts um, had the DM2 mutation. And when they looked at, do these people actually have symptoms and signs? Yes, some of them had an unrecognized muscle weakness. So um, yes, I think there are more people out there that have DM2 but um, we may not have done a good job in identifying the disease. And um, so there's room for improvement. Now, the other notion is that participants in US research studies and registries in our experience are almost exclusively Caucasians. And um, now why is that? Well, part of it is because the mutation is more common in people of European ancestry. And why is that? Well, they tracked back the mutation in European people with DM2. And data showed that the mutation occurred about 200 to 500 generations ago in that European population, and then spread in that European community, and then obviously spread elsewhere to the world. But we live in the US and there's no reason why someone who has symptoms suggestive of DM2 should not be evaluated for DM2. In fact, our clinical practice is that anyone with symptoms suggestive of DM2 needs to be evaluated and you know, including genetic testing for DM2 independent of ethnicity and race. And um, we have to you know, be cautious about that because there might even be a bias um, in our uh, you know, physician colleagues, et cetera, thinking that this, oh, this is a disease in Europeans. Uh, it's not. We, we should really um, evaluate anyone with symptoms. And um, so that's, um, that's to that. Now let's move on and think about symptoms and when do people with myotonic dystrophy type 2 or DM2 develop symptoms. We always talk in averages, but keep in mind that you may have a different experience because you know, there's always a range, but on average, people develop symptoms in the late 30s to mid 40s. And, but what, what I hear a lot is the diagnostic odyssey. So um, people with, particularly with DM2, they have symptoms for a very long time on average, again, in our registry, up to 12 years um, on average that they have symptoms and don't know what's causing the symptoms. And that range again is much larger. So I, you know, I meet people 20 to 30 years they've had symptoms and they didn't know it was DM2. So that's a common, a common shared um, experience. Now, what are the most common first symptoms? Leg weakness, pain, and myotonia. But what symptoms, it's not just leg pain, weakness, and myotonia, what symptoms do patients with DM2 experience? Yes, the muscle symptoms are most common. And um, we're excited to have Lindsay comment a little bit on what we usually do in clinic and how we counsel on how to live with the muscle disease. But other manifestations, because TM not only affects the skeletal muscle that causes movement in the limbs and et cetera. No, it, DM2 can also affect the smooth muscle 
and smooth muscle causes movement in the bowels and, and guts. And so um, the GI system can be involved, um, you know, from the top, from the basophagus goes down to the sphincter and, and that's variable. So people experienced constipation, diarrhea, either or both or alternating and people with myotonic dystrophy type 2 um, on average have their gallstones taken out earlier than the regular population or the, the people without myotonic dystrophy just because the smooth muscle of the the, the the gallbladder which is also the walls of the gallbladder also muscle they don't function as properly and then cataract as you all know um, often an early sign diabetes um, endocrine symptoms and we'll talk about that and then um, the brain effects area we'll be focusing on. And then importantly, the heart um, can be affected specifically with problems with the heart rhythm or heartbeat. And we'll talk about that. And then difficulty breathing in a minority of people. Now, now you may wonder why does DM2 affect so many different symptoms and affecting so many organ systems? Um, to answer this question, we will have to review the root cause of DM2, the genetic mutation that gives rise to myotonic dystrophy type 2. And as you know, we're all made out of genes that contain information about, you know, things like hair color, eye color, etc. These genes are made out of DNA and the DNA sits on chromosomes. You may all know that very well. Um, and uh, this carries instructions for making proteins that we're made of. And um, the issue is that if there's a problem on one of those genes, the problem can be passed on um, to a child. Um, and the problem in DM2 sits here on chromosome three, and the problem in DM1 sits here on chromosome 19. And I just, I just pointed that out because even though DM1 and DM2 share a lot of symptoms, share a lot of mechanistic um, similarities, um, the genetic mutation is distinct, different genes, different chromosomes, but the, the, they do a lot of the similar damage downstream. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But now what's the problem on that gene, on the CNBB gene on the chromosome three? One region, if you take a magnifying glass, one region of the CNBP gene contains a segment of four building blocks, DNA building blocks, um, what we call nucleotides, so C, C, T, G, C, C, T, G. And that's um, repeated multiple times, and that's normal. We all have that sequence, as you see here. But in people without DM2, usually we have less than 26 of those repeats. And in people with DM2, there is more than 75, and usually several thousands and thousands. So the average is about five thousands. So it's, it's really a lot of those repeats. Now, why is this a problem? The DNA gets transcribed into RNA and the RNA is, is a template for making proteins. So the DNA with the expanded repeat gets transcribed into RNA with an expanded repeat. And now then the expanded repeat, which is a CCUG repeat, clump together in the nucleus of a cell. And here you see, uh, this is from a patient actually, this is a DM2 patient, this is a cell, it's kind of dark there. But you see here the RNA, the expanded RNA is labeled in red. And you see that it clumps together right here in the nucleus. And you wonder, well, okay, you have these clumps, but how does this cause disease? Well, it not just only clumps together, it traps important proteins. And those proteins are RNA binding proteins. For example, MBNL. And if you label those in the patient, again, in the patient muscle fiber, again, if you label those with a green, green color, you see that they clump together. What would that look like in a, in a person without DM? It would look like this, where the MBNL protein is just nicely diffusely um, spread in the, in the nucleus and is um, everywhere to do its job. Here it's trapped with the repeats. If you merge them, it looks like this. This is the nucleus here, it's trapped. And so because it's trapped in there, this RNA binding protein, it is not doing its job anymore. What is the RNA binding protein MBNL supposed to do? It's supposed to edit and splice RNAs from multiple other genes. For example, it's supposed to splice the chloride channel RNA. 
And because it's not doing that properly, myotonia occurs. It's not properly splicing the insulin receptor RNA and then diabetes can occur. It's not properly editing calcium channel RNA and then weakness can occur. It's not properly splicing sodium channel RNA and then an irregular heartbeat can occur. And this is mostly shown in DM1. Um, but in the study that um, some of you participated here up in Rochester, we showed that the, these changes, the splicing changes, there's a huge um, uh, overlap between DM1 and DM2. And so basically because this, these proteins are trapped with a toxic clumped up RNA, expanded RNA, um, the proteins cannot do their function anymore and cannot splice and edit these numerous RNAs from other genes. And that way in any tissue where the CNBP gene is expressed, this problem occurs and then multisystemic disease and symptoms can occur. And that's the reason why not only the muscle is affected, but other areas too, such as the brain, the heart, the GI system, et cetera. Now, that is basically shared with DM1, that mechanism of this toxic clumping RNA. But you might wonder, we've heard talks about DM1 a lot and DM2 a little bit, but what is specific about DM2? What research is being done and what, what do we know about what's specific about DM2? And one of the aspects that I just wanted to highlight that was um, discovered not too long ago is that, for example, MBNL, this, this should be familiar to you now. So here you see the RNA clumped together, the MBNL RNA binding proteins clumped together, and then they all clumped together in the nucleus. Same in DM1, DM2. Now, what happens here is that was found that there is another RNA binding protein, not just MBNL, but RBFOX. And that RBFOX is also an RNA binding protein, also edits and splices RNA. But in DM1, it it's doing what it's supposed to do. It's nicely spread and doing its job. But in DM2, it also gets clumped together with the expanded, it binds to that expanded CCUG RNA and clumps together. So said it's something different. And it seems like they're competing with one another, the RBFOX and the MBNL. And that's important to investigate further to understand what that means for drug development. Now let's shift gear and look at something else that's specific about DM2. So DM2, the mutation, the expanded repeats, sits on an intron in the gene. Now here you see, um, this, is an, this is on the gene and this is an exon and this is an intron. And the information that's important for protein production is usually on an exon. So what happens uh, in a normal cell is that when the RNA gets edited, the introns are taken out and then it's nicely linked together so that just the information that's important for proteins is being, being linked together and built. Now what happens in DM2, uh, also more of a recent discovery is that the intron where this expanded repeat sits on gets retained and stays within the RNA and that's been measured. And then, so that's another aspect um, that's, uh, that's different and that requires further, further study. And then, um, our, uh, then another one, RAND translation, um, Dr. Raynham discovered that, um, as did she discover the DM2 mutation. Um, she will give you a talk later on. So I won't talk too much about that and let the specialists comment on that, but that's another feature. And I think Aria will comment on that as well. So there are some things that are very um, different and distinct and that um, require further research in DM2. Now let's shift gears. We've understood now a little bit why so many systems are involved, so many tissue types are involved. Um, variably, again, keep in mind, this um, doesn't mean all of you have the same symptoms. There's a lot of variability that we need to understand more. Um, but um, um, again, um, some, some of you may have uh, a selection of any of these symptoms. But what testing monitoring is needed and how are symptoms of DM2 treated or managed? I won't talk a lot about the most common symptom, which is muscle weakness, because I want Lindsay to have time enough to um, address that. And um, we work closely in clinic together and um, to, to identify how can we make life easier? How, what strategies can we... Um, identify for you. And so Lindsay is key to, to care um, 
for, for our patients with DM2. And um, also uh, exercise. So I, I'll give that to her. Um, but just to um, think about the weakness, you all know best um, where the weakness is, uh, which is again, distinct from myotonic dystrophy type one, because it affects what we call the proximal muscles. And the proximal muscles are these here that are more closer to the trunk. And so the legs, the thighs, hip abduction, you know, when, when you try to lift your legs from the bed and then shoulders can be involved. And in fact, in our study, we found that neck flexion is often one of the weakest muscles. So when you lie in bed and you try to lift up your, your neck um, without raising the shoulders, that, that can be weak, quite weak in some people. Now, one of the things that is um, shared by many people with DM2, about 60 to 80% of people um, report muscle pain. And the way people describe that is this thigh pain, um, but it can also be in the back, neck, and shoulders. And some people have joint pain as well. How do you manage pain? That's um, difficult because uh, to give a one and all answer because there needs to be an individualized strategy. Um, but um, and one, I just want to give away physical therapy assessment, it's incredibly important and exercise, um, you know, evaluation, what kind of exercise, what kind of stretching, what, what helps. And I have a lot of patients who, who report to me that if I didn't exercise every day, I would be, I would not be in good shape. On the other hand, other people say exercise makes it worse. So it's an individualized um, strategy of what's best for the individual. Um, you know, drugs can work. Um, it's trial and error. Um, opioids, we try to stay away from, from many reasons, but also because they make GI, can make GI symptoms worse. Um, always reasonable to have a conversation with your doctor, whether you are on a cholesterol lowering medication, like a statin, like um, uh, Lipitor or something like that, um, because that can make pain worse. Um, but on the other hand, you need to be on a medication. So it's um, a discussion about which one to choose. There are some that are more tolerated. And if you can't tolerate one, there are also um, alternative therapies now out there that can be chosen if there's really a statin intolerance. Now, um, if there is pain that really improves with activity or worsens in cold temperatures, I always, um, you know, advocate uh, if safe um, uh, to treat the myotonia with antimyotonia medications and see if that improves the pain. If it doesn't and you don't feel better, then don't keep taking it. Um, but it's worth a trial usually in, in many people. And so myotonia is the muscle stiffness or the difficulty relaxing the muscles. And some people have it in the hands where it's, you know, when you make a fist and you open your hand and there's just this difficulty opening the hand and the more you do it, the, the less um, uh, marked it is, the better it gets. But um, in DM2, hand myotonia isn't as pronounced. Usually it's more in the proximal muscles, like the muscles we pointed out that are more affected. And so, for example, people describe it as when you sit for a while um, and then get up, there's the stiffness that then loosens up after a while um, or pain that gets worse in the cold. Um, sometimes it's suspicious that myotonia might play a role. So treatments for myotonia, there, there are some others that are more experimental. In general, I have to say, there haven't been clinical trials in DM2. So all of this is based on care guidelines and experience um, and, and strategies that have been successful in DM1 is what we use for treating um, symptoms in DM2. And maxillotine and ranolazine are choices, um, for example. Now, heart disease. Um, symptoms, there may be none, none at all, ever. Um, but if people have symptoms, they can involve dizziness, palpitations, skipping heartbeat, heart racing, chest pain. Um, and generally speaking, every year, a person with DM2 should have an EKG. Um, if the EKG is abnormal or you're older than 40 years, really consult a cardiologist. And I really have a low threshold to just say, just get checked out with a cardiologist. And uh, what is involved? Um, you would think muscle disease, muscle heart muscle must be weak. Um, in a minority of people, that's the case. But um, what's more common is actually that the electrical wiring of the heart is affected. So electrical wiring, well, the nerve get, you know, comes down here and then it transmits the signal to the, um, to the heart and then it travels through here and then it lets the muscle activate. So it's the electrical wiring. And so what happens is that it's slowed in myotonic dystrophy. And so there can be heart block. And we can detect that on the EKG 
that it just slows. And if it does slow to a level um, that is severe, life-threatening or causes symptoms, and that's really a conversation with the cardiologist, then at times a pacemaker needs to be placed. When we looked at the data from the National Registry, which is longitudinal data over 17 years, we looked at how often actually do people with DM2 require a pacemaker or have a pacemaker placed. And that is, as you can see, um, you know, not more than a fifth had a pacemaker placed, but the risk increased at older age. So it's important to follow with the cardiologist. They usually also do echocardiograms. Um, now eyes, um, you all know those can be asymptomatic. So it happens that if you do get a diagnosis of DM2 and then you are evaluated, then uh, cataracts are found or some people had cataracts many, many years ago and it didn't trigger any suspicion and they're already um, treated by cataract surgery because that's really the, the end treatment. But early symptoms can be, sign, can be um, difficulty with vision or difficulty driving at night. And in DM, oftentimes the cataracts are younger and occurring at younger age than you would expect. Um, and the surveillance is see an ophthalmologist every year. Now, GI symptoms, we already mentioned a little bit, um, you know, it can be basically a lot of people had a diagnosed irritable bowel syndrome because the symptoms are similar with um, diarrhea and constipation. Um, consult a GI specialist, um, you know, this is typically from the care guidelines recommended, high fiber diet, try dietary modification, sufficient hydration, the pyramid for diarrhea or these drugs for, for making, making it move. Um, I've also heard that um, nortriptyline or amitriptyline has provided relief. Um, we have little studies on that. Um, we, um, it's often tri times trial and error and it can be frustrating, um, but some people have good success. And then the other thing is constipation is really a big issue. It sounds really simple, but just a little um, stool um, to when you sit on the toilet, just a stool to kind of uh, help um, and put your knees up a little bit can help uh, to make things move along too. Now, endocrine, this I would like to point out that diabetes is actually, when we looked at the registry data again over time or, um, with increasing age, di diabetes. Um, people with DM2 were at greater risk to have diabetes. So what we recommend is really to have a checkup every year and um, get, get checked out for diabetes, thyroid disease. And anesthesia third surgery, I recommend to, um, there's you know limited data, this is the common theme, limited data, um, but we're learning more, but basically be prepared and safe. And most of all, prepare your doctors. Um, so most of your doctors won't, may not have ever heard of my type just to be type two. So go to the website and print out the anesthesia guidelines, hand it out to your doctors in advance so that they learn about DM2 in advance, that they know you might be more sensitive to sedating medications. You might, you know, just watch out for difficulty swallowing or breathing. You're, if you have myotonia, it might get worse in the cold OR when you wake up. Um, there might be more issues with GI symptoms, specifically with opioids, things like that, including the cardiac you know, issues with irregular heartbeat should be known to your doctors. Pregnancy, again, um, for DM2, particularly um, limited um, information, but we know that some people develop their first symptom during pregnancy or that symptoms get worse, but usually they get better after delivery. Miscarriages can occur, UTIs can occur more frequent, and um, it's important to just consult with your team to make sure they're aware um, of your diagnosis. Cancer, another take home message here is that basically stay up to date with your age appropriate cancer screening. It's been published that DM in general, has, that people with DM have a greater risk of cancer compared to people without DM. Um, and the, it's tough to say DM1, DM2, whether DM2, that holds true for DM2 as well. But when we looked at the registry data, we didn't see a difference. So based on that, I, I, I just recommend, and that's also based on the care guidelines to stay up to date to age appropriate cancer screening. As of now, to our knowledge, there's no need to do extensive additional testing or search for cancer or something like that. It's really being up to date on age appropriate cancer screening. What does that mean? See a dermatologist every year. See your OBGYN 
uh, to be evaluated for any abnormalities, you know, in your female organs, uterus. Um, talk to your doctor whether thyroid testing was normal and whether an ultrasound of the thyroid is necessary and stay up to date with colonoscopies just to mention the main, the main points. Um, respiratory weakness, I will be quick because um, Aria will be commenting on that as well, but basically it's in a subset of people with DM2 and what we recommend is if you have symptoms such as shortness of breath when you lie flat or really shortness of breath with activity or a weak cough, or you have frequent respiratory infections, um, then you really have a pulmonary function test, which is this thing where you breathe in and we check how much air fills into your lungs. And then we do the same thing when you lie down, because when you lie down, the diaphragm, the gravity doesn't help anymore. Breathe, you know, the diaphragm breathes, goes down when you breathe in and goes up when you breathe out. And when you sit, gravity helps. But when you lie down, gravity is taken away. So that's a sensitive measure to see if there's any issue with your breathing muscles. And, um, and then otherwise, if you don't have symptoms, um, we do recommend to have pulmonary function test every other, other year as well. And some people with DM2, as you can see here, they do require CPAP or BiPAP, not just for breathing issues, but also for sleep apnea. And I think that Aria will comment on that. So I will close with um, just a slide. If you're interested in getting involved with DM2 clinical research in the US, that's a list of um, places. It might not be all, but that's that I know of. Um, and you can also go to the MBF website or contact any of us about opportunities. And with that, I will end and stop sharing and let Lindsay take over. Thank you for, for listening. Hello, good morning, everyone. Let me see if I can, there we go. Um, thanks for the opportunity to, to speak today. Um, I'm excited to, to go over some of the basic things that I often go over with patients in clinic when I see them um, as a consult. So we'll be talking today about physical therapy and kind of just some modifications to um, adapt to some of the weaknesses or symptoms that you might have. And sorry about that. I couldn't advance the slide. Let's try this. There we go. So just briefly, physical therapists were movement experts that we help people through exercise prescription, manual or hands-on care, as well as education. So talking about anatomy and how that affects um, your symptoms and hopefully preventing things in the future as well. So we diagnose and treat those with injury or disability, but we also can help provide preventative care um, with general health and activity recommendations. We develop individualized treatment plans, and that's something I'm gonna kind of come back to because as um, Dr. Hamill had inferenced a bit, you know, it's really individualized care um, and it's tough to do a, um, a generalized, this is what you should do, but um, there are some common things that we do recommend. So first, one thing that I talk about, because it is can be difficult to find a physical therapist that's first of all familiar with myotonic dystrophy, um, or that understands that goals may be different for people with myotonic dystrophy. So what I recommend is that you can first of all use APTA.org. You can go to find a PT, as you can see right here, and you can search for neurological specialists. That will not pull all the physical therapists in your area that have a neurologic specialty, but it can be a good place to start. Um, you can also talk to your local care center or neurologist to see if there's a physical therapist that they have recommended other patients to. And I sometimes will recommend to patients to call the clinic before your appointment. So even if it's just to say, I have a, an appointment for this, these issues, and this is why I'm coming, but I also have a diagnosis of myotonic dystrophy type two, just to give the therapist a heads up to maybe do some research to understand the disease process before you see them, or if there's a physical therapist in that practice that might have more experience treating um, patients with similar symptoms. I find that that gives people a little bit more success as opposed to going to um, 
kind of your general orthopedic outpatient clinic that you don't get the specialized care that you might um, otherwise. So just in general, these are physical activity guidelines for Americans that were established in 2018, uh, recommending aerobic training at a moderate intensity for about two hours and 30 minutes a week. So about 30 minutes for five days a week. Resistance exercise involving all major muscle groups, two or more days per week. And a moderate intensity means that you're able to talk, um, but not able to sing. So if you're able to walk and talk or run and talk or um, those are all moderate intensity, but if you, if you can't carry a tune while you're doing it, it might be a little bit too much. So examples like brisk walking, water aerobics, bicycling, ballroom dancing, I've done line dancing and that certainly gets your heart rate up too, um, or gardening, things that you, you feel like you're getting your heart rate elevated a bit. And benefits of exercise, um, it can help control weight, it can reduce your risk of cardiovascular disease, as well as type two diabetes and metabolic syndrome, reduce your risk for some type of cancer. And both of those are things that Dr. Hamill's already established or you're at higher risk um, with DM2. It can help strengthen your bones and muscles, improve your mental health and mood, improve your ability to do daily activities. If you're feeling stronger and more adapted to movement, um, you're gonna, things like doing the laundry are going to feel easier than if you're feeling, if you're, you're not doing daily activity and also to prevent falls. And it increases your chances of living longer. So I'm going to point out a resource that you can find on myotonic.org. Um, if you click on the support and care and toolkits and publications, um, you'll find um, a PDF with this as a, the first page here. And it really contains a lot of good information, some of which I'm not gonna cover today, but it goes through again, the benefits of exercise, the different types of exercise, how to get started, how to monitor and adjust exercise. And uh, it also includes a great chart to track your daily activity, which can really help you stay motivated um, and kind of show your progression. It's nice to see that. And if you're not sure where to start, where I get this a lot, like I'm not, I don't know where to, where I should start with my activity. If you feel safe, start with walking and increase your time or your number of steps. I will also recommend in clinic uh, to find or use your phone as a pedometer. And what you can do is track your step count. It also is a good kind of barometer to let you know, okay, if I do 5,000 steps, in one day, I'm feeling pretty good the next day. Maybe I can increase that by 100 steps um, for the following day. Or if I did 12,000 steps in one day, which is a, a good amount, I was really whooped the next day. I didn't feel too great. My muscles were sore. And so you can kind of keep track of how many steps is ideal for you to feel like you're able to do a lot of activity, but also make sure that you're able to um, recover as well. And then I really would recommend seeking out a physical therapy consult if you're um, unsure where to start to evaluate your current fitness and then help develop a, a personalized plan. So being able to follow up with patients. And unfortunately, when I see patients in clinic, I'll still recommend outpatient too, because um, you know I can give you a good place to start, but to really monitor and progress, it's nice to have somebody, even if it's um, on a lower frequency, like once every other week, just to monitor and, and make sure you're on the right track, get the most out of it. Dr. Himmel had um, also discussed these symptoms as well, common symptoms like proximal muscle weakness, which is the muscles closest to the center of the body, daytime sleepiness, which I'm not going to, to discuss that during this presentation, fatigue and muscle pain, and I'm going to be looking at it through the lens of a physical therapist as well. So this is not totally inclusive, but it's parts of it. So similar to the uh, image that Dr. Hamill showed, um, most affected by DM2 are the hips and pelvis, the trunk and neck, and then the shoulder. So you can see, especially in the legs, these are big power muscles that are really used for a lot of daily activities. And then postural muscles, which are silently active throughout the day and really affect how um, you move with all activity. So 
So I'm gonna go through some common complaints due to these weaknesses and how you can address them. So one thing that can be very difficult, again, because those power muscles um, can feel weak, is difficulty standing from a chair or a low surface. Usually couches are the most difficult to get up from. Um, so some adaptive equipment that I've included some pictures here. Um, this first one I've included is a seat lift. And this comes in many different forms. You can usually find them all online if you just Google seat lift. Um, but what it does is that you can see it's got a little hydraulic system. Some of them are electronic, but as you sit down, that seat slowly lowers. So not only does it give you about a three inch lift on whatever seat that you're sitting on, but as you go to stand up, it gives you a little oomph to go ahead and, and finish that stand or at least get it started, which can really help um, when it's difficult to engage your glute muscles um, or your, your quads there to give you a little extra height. Um, again, those come in a, a few different models um, and they're portable, which is nice. So I've had patients that really appreciate being able to go to their favorite diner and not have to worry about getting up from the booth or a lower dining chair. Speaking of dining chairs, um, some people find that at home or at a, at a restaurant, um, finding a, a pub height table um, with chairs. So sitting up you know, in kind of the bar area or um, something with a little extra height can be helpful where again, you're not getting up from that low surface. You get a little extra height. Um, bed risers, which are in stores now because of all the college kids going back. So I, I recommend if you, if you need them to get them now, they might be on sale. Um, these can go under a bed to make the bed higher, but I've also had folks use it underneath couches because those tend to be kind of lower. Um, so it gives you, I, th I think it's about two to three inches depending on the brand that you, that you use. They can go under the foot of furniture. And then again, if exercise is important, that's gonna be a theme we come back to. So exercises like this, the mini squat at your counter, go, what you wanna do is stand up nice and tall, shoulders back, and you're gonna pretend like you're about to sit down. You can go down maybe three or four inches, and then you're gonna stand back up and engage those big power muscles as best you can. So kind of squeezing your bottom together, really making sure that you're standing up nice and tall. And those are a good way, that's a nice, easy, safe way to practice. Um, engaging those muscles. You can do it in front of a chair as well if you're nervous about not being able to, to stand all the way back up. And then if you are able to stand up, but it, you wanna make sure that you're keeping your muscles strong, you can also practice just going from sit to stand. So adding repetitions throughout the day will help get those muscles stronger. So say if you're getting up to um, go get some lunch, that you stand up and down from the chair maybe two or three times. And then when you get back, same thing. It's a, a, a easy way to insert exercise throughout the day. Another common complaint is difficulty getting out of bed due to neck and trunk weakness. So you can see here, I've included a picture of a bed rail. This is something that would go on the side of your bed, um, that this would go in between the mattress and the box spring to keep it stable but it gives you a nice sturdy surface to help pull yourself up to the edge of the bed. And also using a log roll technique, rolling to your side before you get up can be helpful, especially if your neck muscles are weak and that way you're able to um, compensate a little bit easier. I've also had patients kind of um, roll to the side and use their hand against their head too to help support as you get up. And then difficulty keeping your head up for long periods of time due to neck weakness. So you kind of get the, this head drop a little bit, not as common that I see, um, but it is something that I have heard um, in clinic. And that's when this headmaster collar can be um, beneficial, even if it's just intermittent throughout the day to give those muscles a little bit of a break. That this um, soft piece down here would go around, right around your collarbones, and then the top piece would go underneath your chin. So it help keep your um, head supported throughout the day. So another one, and probably one of the more common things I hear in clinic is difficulty getting up and down the stairs because of hip weakness mostly. Again, those big power muscles, your glutes, your quads, and your hamstrings are all very active when you do this activity. Um, so using assistive devices like a cane, 
or making sure you have one or two sturdy railings installed. Um, uh, if it's really quite difficult for you, you can look into getting a chairlift installed. This is a very expensive option, but if it's something that you feel like you'll be using for a long time or staying in the, your home for a long time, it can be a great option. And then considering when you're choosing a home setup, or if you feel like you want to start setting up your living environment on the first floor to accommodate for that, for, um, for ease and for safety. You can also try an alternative method like backwards or sideways. They use different muscles. So depending on where your weakness is, you can um, get around that or compensate for that by trying a different technique. You can also decrease the height of the stairs. And this is most common that I see, especially on exterior stairs. So building a half step um, in between stairs to, to make it a little bit easier. And then again, exercise to strengthen the weak muscles if, as much as you can. So again, the mini squats are great. Um, standing marches to practice lifting your legs up high enough. And then sometimes even just practicing the stairs if it's just one at a time. And then difficulty grooming during, due to shoulder weakness. Um, this can be challenging, especially if you, if you um, blow dry your hair or if you style it. Um, I've had patients with some success using an arm like this to hold the hair dryer, and you can use just one arm down to the side and not have to hold the heavy hair dryer out to the side like this. There are um, lots of different models, some that attach to the wall. This one looks like it attaches to the counter, but that can take um, one heavy object out of your hands while you're doing that. A long um, handled sponge or loofah can also be helpful in the shower. So, and again, exercise to help with it as well. We're working on range of motion, which I'll talk about in a couple of slides here, and then working on muscle balance with PT to make sure you're not injuring um, your shoulder during activity, which again, I'll talk about in a little bit here. And then back pain due to trunk weakness. This is also a common complaint. So um, exercise, working on diaphragmatic breathing and activating some of those deeper core muscles can be helpful. Usually that would be something where I would refer out to a physical therapist for an outpatient consult because it is something that you would want to progress. But also orthotics, um, as you can see here, just like a soft LSO to help give you some support at your back can um, help with some of the pain as well. So I'm just gonna touch on fatigue briefly here. Um, there's likely, it's multifactorial, but could be caused by inappropriate use of weak muscles. Um, so again, using muscles to compensate, um, to do activities that they're not meant to do can cause muscle fatigue or generalized fatigue, um, not enough sleep. Um, and it can definitely affect your daily activities. So thinking about pacing your days can be helpful if this is a, a big um, symptom for you. So knowing that you have a busy day tomorrow maybe you, you do a little bit less or just make sure you're not overworking things to, um, today. And then allowing recovery time after strenuous activity. And this is good for everyone. If you exercised really hard today, making sure that you have time to, to rest the muscles um, tomorrow, as well as some active recovery. So active recovery, meaning that you don't wanna just rest the muscle. You also wanna make sure that you're keeping it a little bit active so you don't get a lot of lactic acid buildup and pain from that. And then decreased motivation. I mean, this is a, a common complaint across the board. Um, one of the most important things you can do is find an activity that you enjoy and set goals that are meaningful to you. So again, this is when that individualized care plan can be helpful. Sometimes exercising with another person to help give accountability and a, a motivation to, to get out the door or start. And then taking note of your progress, like I mentioned. You can see here, I've included the calendar that's in that exercise um, guidelines from the myotonic.org. And then I'll talk a little bit about muscle pain as well from a physical therapy perspective. Um, we talk a lot about muscle balance in physical therapy because weak muscles can cause an uneven pull around joints. So a weak muscle, say um, if you have a weak muscle, most commonly we see in the 
front of your leg, the muscles to pull your toes out. Maybe not with myotonic type two, but this is, tends to be a good, good way to um, describe it. The muscles in the front of your leg are weak. It's tough to pull up your toes. So the muscles in the back of your leg can often get tight. Um, and then it makes it even harder for that weak muscle to pull against the tight muscle. So what we as physical therapists will do will help try to restore that muscle balance um, to help increase the, the weak muscle as much as we can, um, but also make sure that that tight muscle is loose enough so the weak muscle can function to the best of its ability. Um, also making sure that you include a warm up and a cool down during exercise is important to make sure that um, you're able to slowly ease into the, the exercise to reduce any um, myotonia that you might have, and then cooling down to make sure you slowly um, return your heart rate back to normal and keep that active recovery time. So in between, you know, if you start out slow walking, you can increase to brisk walking, and then again, a couple of minutes of slow walking. And then heat can also help achy muscles if you find um, especially in the shoulder and neck, those muscles especially respond really well to heat. And then stretching and range of motion brings its muscle to its longest position. So we talk about this with muscle balance. It's usually with a prolonged hold time for about 20 to 30 seconds. Um, it improves flexibility and can help reduce pain and improves function. So again, allowing your muscles to work at their maximum um, abilities. Range of motion, on the other hand, is bringing a joint through the full motion. So this may or may not cause a stretch, but making sure that you're able to bring the joint through the full range of motion can be helpful to decrease pain and allow for more movement. It also keeps the joint healthy and prevents that tightness or movement restriction at a joint level, not necessarily just the muscle. And that can be passive, where you have somebody help you move the muscle. So if you can't bring your arm all the way up, you have somebody help you. Active assisted, which could be, for instance, using the table, having your arm on the table and you move forward to go ahead and get the range of motion there, or active. And that's it for my presentation. Thank you again for your, your time. Hand this off here. Thank you, Lindsay. That was excellent. Um, I always learn <laughs> listening to you. Um, so now we'll have Aria take over. Here we are. Can you hear me? Okay. So first I want to thank the MDF and the organizing committee for this opportunity to talk with the M2 community. Um, for those who did not know where um, Wake Forest University is, is, we are in a small town called Winston-Salem in the Triad area in North Carolina. So um, some of you may know since you travel for the study, but um, for those who do not know, you know, we are in this little tiny area. Um, let me see. Okay. So my talk today is going to be focused on the brain effects of DM2 and how much impacts on quality of life. So, you know, as you may know, up to about two thirds of DM2 patients that um, has reported brain related symptoms is actually is one of the most disturbing symptoms and it has a lot of impact to the quality of life. But it's not everybody has brain symptoms, right? About one third of DM2 has, you know, no symptom at all, or even, you know, they thought they have symptoms, they went on testing and they have normal cognitive testing. Um, apparently for those who has um, brain related symptoms, it could be cognitive behavior, sleep related, or even fatigue. It, it is a very high disease impact and it's affect quite a lot on quality of life. So, you know, lots of people will talk about brain fog, they have, you know, difficulties, you know, maintaining the task, they have poor sleep quality, and we're going to talk through that, you know, one on one in the symptoms related to, uh, to the brain. <clears throat> there are some overlaps, 
And they also have some distinction between the CNS symptoms in DM1 and DM2. But the good news is that over the last five years, this researcher has done tremendously progress and they have a lot of disease mechanisms that some of them are confirmed in the muscle, but some of them are also kind of confirmed and some are new mechanism that's emerging in the brain. The bad news is that, you know, we have a lot of, you know, things moving, um, you know, for the, um, you know, scientists are the bench part of the you know research but we don't have a lot of clinical data that you know would move this forward or you know to correlate you know what the scientists you know at the bench lab discover and how do we correlate those with you know you know symptoms that the patient you know report to us so today we're going to focus on disease mechanisms um, particularly some that you know pretty new into the into the brain of DM2. And we're gonna talk through the brain-related symptoms. I'm gonna focus more on the cognitive and, and sleep. And then, you know, we talk, you know, if we have time, we talk on um, fatigue and pain. And, you know, of course, the management. And let's see if time allow, if time allow, we touch base on the research um, on the pilot study that has been completed at Wake Forest University in DM2. So, <clears throat> A lot of what we know from the CNS came from what we know about the muscle, right? So we learned the lesson molecularly from the muscle. And you all remember this, um, DM starts with the repeat and the repeat caused the um, these RNA inclusion that accumulated in the nucleus. And this is the, you know, the picture from um, Dr. Thornton lab. And this is in the toxic RNA that accumulated in the nucleus of the muscle fiber. And from that changes, you know, that going to the change the way the RNA is processed and that going to the change in the proteins and change in function. So that's the essence that has been worked out largely in the muscle. So what about the brain? So we can study muscle in a very details, right? We can biopsy the muscle, but we cannot really biopsy the brain. So we can study from the Art, you know, the, the autopsy, you know, or the tissue of the postmortem brain. So we take a lesson from muscle and we apply that into the brain and we find a lot of the same things. So first of all, um, I'm gonna show you this cartoon. It looks a little bit complex, but um, just look at that, you know, this is all the <clears throat> repeats that form like a happy structure. And um, what the researcher found is that first they find that, you know, they see the same accumulation of the RNA in the nucleus of the neuron. So this is the neuron, right? And this is the nucleus of the neuron. And this is the surrounding structure that causes cytoplasm. <clears throat> so they found the same thing that they find in the muscle. And that also lead to changes in protein and changes in function. And they also discover a new emerging, and this is the process of RNA toxicity. So they also discover the emerging um, disease mechanism in the brain that actually has shown in the brain autopsy of TM2. And this is the process that discovered by Dr. Laura Ranum, which is gonna talk after our session at the University of Florida. So this is a process that's called RNA translation. So what RNA translation has anything to do with <clears throat> the brain changes in DM2? <clears throat> so apparently the RNA translation, you know, they, they build up the proteins and these proteins are toxic to the brain cells. And it's interesting that, you know, there are different types of protein that caused by RAN translation. And some of them have the specific, you know, different protein deposit in the different area of the brain. And I will show you in a second. Um, and apparently this process is, is independent toxic, you know, um, it's independent of the RNA toxicity that, that happened in the nucleus. And we don't know, there may be other mechanism that hasn't been discovered, you know, yet. But so far right now, we know that there are two main uh, mechanisms that can cause the, the effect in the brain. One is RNA toxicity and the other one is called RAN translation. So what we find from the, um, the RNA toxicity. So this is just a picture that shows you that on the top row is the brain of DM1. 
the lower part is the brain of DM2. <clears throat> and there is the evidence of what um, Dr. Hamill has been talking about RNA splicing. And yes, it happened the same thing in the brain. So the RNA splicing, there is changes in different proteins and it also splicing and affecting something called tau protein. So it's got accumulated, you know, in many areas of the brain. So this is the top part is DM1 and the lower part is DM2. So you can see that all this clump of the brown spot is actually clump of the tau staining. So what important of the tau? The tau is the protein that actually helps stabilize the internal structure of the brain cell. So it's also like kind of like a, a structure that like a tube like that kind of deliver all the nutrients and other essential substances, you know, to the different part of the brain. So meaning that if there is aggregated of the tau, you know, which we see in neurodegenerative diseases as well, then there will be disrupted of the nutrient and the essential substances to the different part of the brain. What about RAN protein? Remember this cartoon. So, and I, as I said, you know, there are two different types of protein and it's deposited in the different areas of the brain. It's quite interesting. There is a one protein, um, it's called LPAC. So you can see that this is the, um, this, the, brain, the, the brain of the healthy control. And on the right-hand side <clears throat> is the brain of DM2. So this is a staining of the RAN protein and, and the scientists know the, the RAN protein is toxic to the brain cell. So you can see that pink clumping, you know, that deposit in all over, you know, the brain. And this is particularly in the gray area. The gray matter area is the area that basically in the surface of the brain is on the top part and is actually, um, you know, very um, important function is, you know, you know, with cognitive and, and other executive function. And they also found a different um, protein that called QAGR. And you can see that the top is the healthy control. So there's nothing staining. And you know, you can see all this pink column staining, you know, which is basically toxic to the neuron. It's not only just like toxic to neuron cell. They also found that um, um, apparently this RAN protein also affect with the white matter integrity or on another word, it's, it's, it's quality of the white matter. So when you think about white matter, it's a deeper part of the brain. It's like a highway and the road. So if you want to have everything go smoothly, what you have to do, you have to have a good dense fiber track and that needs to be very organized. Things are going to one way and not just like one car going the, the front, the other car going the back, right? So what you can see that this is a staining of the white matter you know, density. And you can see in the lower part of the brain, which is the DM2, that you can see that the fiber of the white matter tract has become loose and it looks like disorganized. So not only just like directly toxic to the cell, it's also affecting the quality of, of the fiber in the brain. From that, one of the way that the researcher has been studied is that, you know, they're looking at the brain imaging in DM2. So they use the MRI scans so we can get a better understanding of what the structure changes are in the CNS and there are changes in the brain of DM2. So this is studied back in 2004. So what they found in the brain of DM2 is that there are some volume loss, which is called brain atrophy. But more important than that, they're very striking that they have, you know, like a white matter, you know, hyperdensity, which is basically, you can see all these white matter patches, you know, that um, outstanding from DM2 brain. <clears throat> so from 2004 going back to 2011, so MRI is getting more fancier and it's more elegant, it's much more objective and, and, and it become quantifiable, right? You can quantify something. And um, they found an abnormal, um, you know, diffusely, you know, abnormal structure in the white matter. And this is the, the biggest study that we have it, you know, so far is come from um, the German group. But in this study, they didn't find anything changes in the gray matter, which is basically in the, um, the top part of the brain. And, you know, there is an issue of this study that, you know, first of all, it contains very small sample size. And, you know, this is, we're talking about 2011, it's a decade ago, and it hasn't been have any bigger studies since, right? So um, this, the finding of 
ones that it might not, you know, consistent with the other. So we have issue of inconsistency and we don't have enough um, data in terms of longitudinal study, like whether the changes that we see in the MRI has it progress over time, has, you know, cognitive function changes over time, we don't know. And we do not know how these changes that we see in the MRI correlate with cognitive testing, and the most importantly is correlated with the patient symptoms. Going back, so we're gonna to move to the, um, the symptoms that related to the brain. Um, so first of all, we're gonna talk about the cognitive function. So we know that people who um, has DM2, two thirds of them, you know, complains a lot about, you know, various, um, you know, symptoms, like most of them, you know, this is based on direct experience that I, I see patients with DM2s, I talk to them, you know, um, you know, when they're interested in participating in the study, you know, or patient that I have been follow up five years in Pittsburgh. So what they complain to me is, you know, their brain is fogged, you know, they used to be able to handle things, you know, multitask, and now, you know, suddenly they lost that opportunity. Some people complain about, you know, they was able to talk, you know, in the, you know, give presentation for decades, they can memorize things, they can improvise things, and suddenly they lost that opportunity, yeah, that, that kind of skills, right? So, um, some people also say that, you know, sometimes they think about one thing and then <laughs> they say the opposite thing <coughs> to what, what they plan to, to say. And, it, you know, patients also complain of they have, um, you know, slow processing speed, which meaning that they cannot do multitask, they cannot do a complex task, and they also have issue with focus attention. So in terms of behavior, um, we find that, you know, some patient with DM2 has depression, and we do not know if the depression is actually is an effect of DM2 directly to the brain, or is this actually is a reaction to the chronic disease. So we don't have evidence for that. And, you know, there are, you know, data from the Italian group that showing that for people who are highly educated, um, they tend to find like the compulsive personality and also they are report of avoidance personality. But most DM2 patients that I talk to, they more focus on the cognitive function, particularly with the executive, executive function. So are there any overlaps or distinction between DM1 and DM2? Yes. So the good news is that you can see from the table, right? So DM2 has, although less cognitive severity comparing to DM1, but it's, it doesn't mean that it doesn't affect quality of life, it has a high impact. But, you know, if you look at the global IQ, you know, DM2 is pretty impact. You know, I have DM2 patient who's highly educated, two master degree, PhD, any kind from, you know, anything in between that. And they used to be, they used to, you know, good with their job, you know, function well. And, you know, when they hit 50 or mid 50, and then, you know, these um, cognitive, you know, symptoms get started, you know, to catch on them. <clears throat> so DM2 also have issue with some verbal fluency. So sometimes they have issue with like thinking about words and didn't come out, you know, or, you know, what it called episodic verbal memory loss. Um, DM1 is more on the hypersomnolence in terms of sleep issue, and DM2 is more on the poor sleep quality. One thing that's very interesting is that DM1 has a lot of apathy. So apathy is more like, you know, you, you're aware of yourself, you, 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 you recognize what's going on. Um, <clears throat> if you ask DM1 patient that, you know, oh, how's your sleep, you know, been, they would just say, well, you know, I sleep fine, but you can see that they were about to fall asleep in front of you. On the opposite, the M2 is really aware of what's going on with them. And I think this is really good. So that's why, you know, um, many DM2 are careful of monitoring of their symptoms. And, you know, they're really good in compliance. They're very good in follow-up with, you know, the physician or provider. So like I said, sleep is pretty much in DM2 that has been reported. It's poor sleep quality. And that could be because of, you know, there is some DM2, you know, the genetic effect directly to the sleep, you know, um, area in the brain. But it also have 
could be some other contributing factor, you know, coming from DM2 could have obstructive sleep apnea, they can have restless leg syndrome, and, and that could contribute to their sleep fragmentation and that, you know, leading to sleep, poor sleep quality, right? And like um, Dr. Hamel said that, you know, 60 to 80% of DM2 can have severe diffuse unexplained pain. And if, you know, pain is not controlled, that could affect the sleep as well. So I'm not going to talk about fatigue and pain because of, you know, Lindsay and Dr. Hamill has touched base on that. But this is a never ending discussion because of, we don't really know exactly if fatigue and pain is solely peripheral, which means muscle. Because of, we have some patient that doesn't really weak a lot, but has severe fatigue. And we have patient that basically pretty, you know, mildly weak or, you know, almost full strength but has severe pain. And we don't know if that pain is actually muscle alone or muscle plus central pain, which is basically part of it is coming from the brain. So in terms of management, um, you know, for the cognition, I think the key is to recognize the symptom and understanding that the symptom could be part of the disease. Then, you know, usually if the patient complained to me, I send him, you know, to have neuropsychological assessment. And if, you know, it doesn't guarantee that, you know, this is always has to be from DM2, they could have some other disease. And if it's very highly suspicious, they have some other neurological finding, I would consider, you know, and this is case, case by case basis, you know, a baseline MRI to make sure that we didn't miss any other thing, right? You know, anybody could have stroke, anybody could have multiple sclerosis as well. And this is like, um, is a data from the European group. They found that, you know, Arabic exercise along with cognitive behavioral therapy has helped. Um, if you have access to this treatment, it is good to, to try. But if you don't, it is, it's, it, it's not for everyone. And then if there is a lot of, you know, um, symptoms that related to cognition, I usually refer them to see behavioral neurologists as well. So in terms of, you know, mood and emotion, if, you know, if this is a very concern, is pretty significant in the patient, I consult psychiatrists or psychother psychotherapists and they could start the patient on antidepressant if the EKG is normal or a psychotherapy. And I, you know, many patients feel it's very helpful. <clears throat> I think for sleep, we usually screen for excessive daytime somnolence. It is not, um, you know, for DM2 is not as severe as DM1, but I think I, you know, if the patient, you know, tell me that they have a lot of sleep, you know, symptoms, I send them for sleep study and I screen them with, um, you know, um, the, the scale of the daytime somnolence. If it's very severe, I refer them to see sleep specialist. And I will always check for respiratory muscle weakness because that will dictate, you know, what kind of you know, mode or, you know, if, if they have sleep apnea, do they need to be on CPAP or do they need to be on BiPAP or different kind of modes? And, and the respiratory muscle weakness could be part of the sleep, um, sleep difficulty or sleep related symptoms. And the most important part is this about sleep hygiene. So I have a lot of trick of how to improve it, but I don't think I have time to go over it. So we can talk about it. If you're interested, just, you know, um, contact me after the session and then refer to sleep specialist. Um, this is also case by case basis. I would, you know, some patient you know, who has a lot of daytime somnolence and the sleep study is abnormal, I would consider stimulants. Um, fatigue and pain. Um, I really think that manage has been covered by Dr. Hamill and Lindsay, so I will skip that. So with that said, I will finish with this slide. Um, so what is the pathway to CNS clinical trials in DM2? We need to develop a very reliable and sensitive imaging measures, which is you know, quantitative MRI measures is crucial to inform the trial design, right? And we need to identify the endpoints, particularly in the cognitive and you know, behavioral endpoints that reliable, very specific in DM2 and clinically relevant. And I really think that the marker of the brain pathology is really important. Not like, you know, we cannot go biopsy the, you know, the, 
is like the muscle, right? But we need something that could represent the pathology that's going on in the brain. And I think that the way to go is, you know, with the spinal fluid and some of them are considered um, non-invasive biofluid. For example, we work with a group with, um, at MGH about urine biomarker, which is non-invasive. <clears throat> and then the most important thing is to look at the correlation that how the brain changes affecting the function. And lastly, is there any role of the brain, this function in DM2 that driving the motor part? So I think we are out of time. So I will skip my pilot study result. Anybody who, you know, interested in knowing um, can reach out to me after um, the session. Happy to talk to anybody. And lastly, I want to thank um, my team at Wake Forest who worked very hard on the cognitive evaluation. I want to thank my prior mentor, Dr. Peg Nopoulos at University of, Flo uh, of Iowa and her team who has done a trem tremendously job on analyzing the MRI brain in my pilot study. Um, two collaborators um, at MGH, Dr. Clemens and you know, the MDA for the study at University of Pittsburgh. And lastly, I want to thank Mautonic Dystrophy Foundation, DM2 participants, DM2 patient, caregiver, and all the community. For those who I haven't reached out, you know, for the brain study in DM2, um, we will be in touch, you know, we just, you know, completed the study and we hope to, to, to you know, continue the study in the next step. With that said, um, I will stop sharing my slide and I don't know if we have time for question, but thank you for your attention. Thanks so much, Aria. That was exciting. Um, and we're looking forward to hear more about your work in the future. Um, I think we ran out of time. Um, Nadine, I'm not sure. I, I encouraged everyone to send us questions um, either right here in the chat, but better is probably contact us through the portal. You can each click on our um, profile and then send us a personal message. And that way we can keep the conversation going. Um, and yeah, thank you so much. We're also always happy to hear feedback, comments, research ideas. <laughs> um, thank you. Absolutely. So thank you to all of our panelists today. And you can continue to reach them, um, as Dr. Johanna Hamel said, um, throughout the platform, throughout this conference. Have a good day. Enjoy the next session.